Greetings and salutations to all you folks out there. It's been a while since we've done this. I'm actually set up for another tutorial video, and this is a unit specifications video. If you want in-depth strategies and a bunch of other discussions on how to use units, there's going to be a little bit of that here, but it's mainly just details about the units. And it's a lot of numbers and a lot of statistics and all this kind of thing, but it's very useful information to know if you wish to play this game on a little bit higher level. It's best to know what your units are capable of, how they're going to act, and what the deal is with all the different factions. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the Tech 4 units. Now, to clarify, I am not doing Naval Tech 4, and I am not doing Game Enders. I am strictly doing land-based and air-based Tech 4 units, so this should be pretty simple to get through. Um, let's go ahead and start off with Cybrin. Now, Cybrin has got two direct fire experimentals. They have the Monkey Lord and the Megalith. And it's kind of interesting that they have two. Most of the other factions either have one or none. But Cybrin got lucky, and it's two very different tools. And this is something that you really need to realize because a lot of people will use a Monkey Lord like it's a Yathatha or a GC, but it is not. Some statistics to throw at your way real quick. Standard health before any veterancy and whatnot is 45,000. It does a whopping 4,000 damage, but it has a relatively short range. It's only going to reach out to 30. It does have two electron bolters, which total out to about 430 damage per second, which do have a much longer range at 64. People don't really think about the tiny range of these things, but... Uh, let me see if I can get them to fire here. Those two little dots right there. Because they look dinky next to the microwave laser, but seriously, the thing is laying down more damage than a Percival does at a far, far greater range. It's like out uh, out here somewhere. Um, so don't forget that it does have the bolter. Very useful for vetting up on Tech 1 and Tech 2 units. You can kind of skirt around the outside edge using the special ability Cloak. Or not cloak, stealth. The Monkey Lord does have a stealth field. Um, it used to be personal stealth, but it is now a stealth field. It will stealth any units in the general vicinity of the Monkey Lord, so you can use this to hide flak and accompanying tanks as you're moving across. Now, the Monkey Lord is not a frontal assault weapon. It does not have the range, and it does not have the health to go base wrecking. It just can't do it, so please, folks, stop sending a Monkey Lord in versus T3 point defense and expecting it to win, because it's not going to happen. For that matter, don't send it in versus two or three ACUs in the same spot, because a couple overcharges a piece and your Monkey Lord's dead and there's a mass donation. So please, please keep that in mind. Uh, when you're using the Monkey Lord, it is an ambush slash heavy rating slash single ACU sniping mechanism, and it does a very good job of doing that. Uh, definitely use the stealth to sneak up on people. It costs less than the other T4s. It is the cheapest one at 19000 and because it's cheaper, it is, of course, significantly worse to balance it out. And you can see right here the Athatha's range versus the Monkey Lord's range, how much earlier the Yathatha can start firing at the Monkey Lord and then with the health advantage and everything else. It just usually doesn't end well for the Spider. Now moving on, oh, one other thing to mention, the Monkey Lord does actually have anti-air. It is got uh, dual guns at 40 DPS a piece that launch once per second. So it is actually relatively effective at knocking down Mercies. The Monkey Lord is going to be a little bit more difficult to kill with Mercies. You're going to have to send a whole lot of them, but it will eventually die. But it's going to take a lot of effort from the other team. The other thing that it does have is a 50 DPS uh, torpedo weapon, which is not really anything to speak of, but it is there, just so you know. The other Cybern T4 for the ground weapons is the Megalith. Now this is a beast. Remembering that the Monkey Lord costs 19,000 mass, the Megalith costs a whopping 37,500, making it the most expensive land-based experimental outside of the Scathus, and I'll get to that in just a minute. 
This thing is going to hands down beat a GC or a Yathatha or a Megalith or pretty much anything else. The only thing, the only single T4 that really has a chance of killing it is the Fat Boy, and it takes an extensive amount of kiting and a good bit of luck to pull that off. So it's not really. It is far more expensive than the others, but it is going to win. So just keep that in mind. Megalith has good range. It does reach out to 64, and it does a combined 2,300 damage. It's uh, 1,153 on each gun. Got to work on my mental math here. Have not done it in a while, and I'm a little bit rusty. Um, the other weapon that it has in its arsenal is the torpedo launcher. This thing actually does 308 damage with torpedoes over 45 range, which is the... Actually, there is not a torpedo range on this one. It's going to be somewhere right there. Um, the Megalith kind of doubles as a Cybran C experimental. It does do enough torpedo damage that it is actually very useful versus Navy. And the other thing that it has going for it is its height. The Megalith is actually very high off the ground. And its main cannons are mounted directly on the top. So you can actually stand in relatively deep water and use both of the main cannons to fire on Navy. Another thing that the Megalith has that's very useful is a speed boost. When it is traveling in water, it actually travels faster than it does on land, further boosting its naval capabilities. So this guy is at home on the land. It is the single most powerful direct fire T4. And in the water, it is very strong, can easily handle itself, and it has a whopping 110,000 health. An enormous amount, even more than the GC sitting at 99. But again, all that comes at a price. It does have an anti-torpedo weapon, not a very good one, but it does have it. It's six projectiles on 7.7 .7 seconds, but it's basic collision torpedo defense and in my experience, not the most expensive thing, or, or uh, the most effective thing on the face of planet Earth. And then it does have basic flak with 30 DPS, not going to save you in from any air units, but it's there. It can plink away. It might take down a Mercy or two. So that wraps up the Cybran base T4s, and then... The other one that I'm going to mention in this one is the Scathus, and technically this is a base wrecker slash game ender, but I'm putting it on this list because a lot of people use it for naval denial, for um, large force denial. It is an incredibly inaccurate, very high damage unit that costs an absurd amount of mass, but basically anything that comes in range of that yellow circle right there on the outside edge will be obliterated. There is no doubt about it. This thing is freaking strong. Scathus uh, only has 17,500 health. It costs 85,000 mass and more power than I really want to think about. And it is very slow at 1.5 speed, but it can move and it is an incredibly effective piece of mobile artillery. It lays down 1,578 DPS um, that is one projectile every two, roughly two seconds, and each projectile hit does 3,000 damage, and the area of effect is huge. Seven area of effect, and it is incredibly inaccurate. You can see here how widespread the projectiles are, but it is incredibly good at knocking out groups of units. So this is going to be a very strong tool in the Cybern's arsenal if you can get up the funds to build it. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, fire this real quickly so you can see. One other thing to mention about the Megalith that I forgot is it is a mobile factory. You can actually build things with it. Um, you can lay an egg. That is a crab egg. And let's lay a bouncer egg. And it will lay an egg that has a little build time and it will... Oh, well, I skipped it. My bad, peoples. There we go. You can actually finish building the egg with an engineer, I do believe. And what, since you can lay an egg and it technically has an engineering suite, you can actually reclaim wrecks underneath the megalith by laying an egg. I just found out about that the other day and it is an incredibly useful tactic. Very cool thing to do. All right, so there's that. 
and the egg opens and bam there is our mobile anti-air alrighty guys and let's move on from cyber before I waste a whole bunch more time on that let's go to UEF UEF has very slim pickings on the T4 front they have the fat boy all by its lonesome and it is not even a direct fire T4 and if you remember from the T T3 video the Percival is kind of like a T3.5. If you build up a mass of Percivals, it is much stronger than the direct fire T4s, mass for mass, and the UEF uses that strength to make up for the fact that it does not have an actual direct fire T4. The Fat Boy is also a mobile factory. You can build units out of the back, and it has an absolutely ludicrous amount of build power. You can see it can build a Titan in about 13 seconds, and it's burning 36 mass to do so. It's gonna spit it right out the back and we'll have our units online. Both of these are very useful for laying down an engineer in captured territory. So there's our Titan. Um, Fat Boy has 12,000 health, but it does have another 20,000 health in its shield. So it's very, very light on the health side of things. It makes up for that with superior range. It can fire a long, long ways. This is a bombardment weapon. And it is basically cover fire for the other UEF forces. You can pair this with a fronting wall of Percivals. Percivals will soak up the damage and kill off any T4s that might bother this thing. And this will wreck bases in advance of the T4s moving in. It does outrange all stationary defenses except for TML and Tech 2 artillery. It outranges T3 mobile, um, all of the point defense and everything like that. The main cannons, there are four cannons doing 750 damage per second. And that's... Uh, it also has a riot gun, two riot guns, for 500 damage per second that's only range out to 45. So that's going to be about right here. So a thousand combined damage on the riot guns and then 3,000 damage on the long range guns. So you can see this thing packs in an incredible amount of DPS but is very low on health and quite slow. It can only run at 1.7 speed. Now it does have two anti-air guns and those combined do about 112 DPS and then it does have a torpedo weapon that does 75 DPS. So neither one of those is too terribly impressive but they do function. And then the other thing that the Fat Boy has going for it is air staging. It actually has two pads on top, it can handle two Tech 1 units or one T3 and it is a refueling station so you can actually use that out in the field, it's a pretty cool ability. You can actually dock air units with it as well. Um, not that that's incredibly useful but you can do it. So that is the Fat Boy and the sum total of the UEF experimentals. Let's go ahead and move on to Aeon. Aeon has the Galactic Colossus, which is gen generally considered to be the uh, the best all around T3. It has a good mix of damage per second and health. It has a claw ability and good movement speed, and it has Omni, so it doesn't get surprised very easily. All in all, I would say that the GC is probably the single best T4 um, just with all the features that you get. Let's go ahead and run them down. 99,999 health. Why they didn't just give it 10, 000, or 100,000 health, I will never know, but that is how it is. You can see that it does have an Omni circle around it. The Omni is uh, 50 range, the same as Vision. So this is the one T4 that can actually defend itself against a Cybran Mazer Com. The cloak does it no good. The GC can see it coming from a mile away. And you'll notice that since the Omni range is bigger than the attack range, the GC will actually have time to turn and face the incoming target before it enters attack range, which makes the GC a very useful tool versus anything cloaked, stealth, or otherwise concealed. The main gun is a 2,500 damage per second beam that originates right from the face of the GC, and I need to put it on ground fire before I do that. There we go. Right from the eyeball. And 
this uh, is not the highest damage gun you will ever see, but when you combine it with the long range and the fact that the GC has such an incredible amount of health, this gun definitely gets the job done. Um, it is a massive unit, so it does crush units under its feet, which is kind of handy. And then it has two tractor claws. And these technically don't have a damage per second number, but um, the tractor claws suck up units. So if there's a host of T3 here, um, the tractor claws will slowly suck them up one by one and destroy them as soon as they hit the claw. And I don't really have... I, I'm... Mm, I'm not going to show an example of that here. You guys will know what it looks like when you see it. What I will say is that when you're walking, the claws seem to be less effective. And also the claws are more effective when you're directly, squarely facing a group of oncoming units. You're standing still and they're moving. That seems to be the most effective. They're a little bit glitchy. Sometimes when it's walking, only one or the other will work. And very rarely, neither one will work. But usually when you're standing still, both claws will work at maximum efficiency. And because of this, the Galactic Colossus is actually capable of doing far more damage than its measly 2,500 damage per second would imply because it's snapping up a Tech 3 unit every 6 or 7 seconds and instantly dealing, in the case of the Percival, over 9,000 damage per second, just straight up eliminating a T3. And this also allows the Galactic Colossus to vet up fairly quickly. So it, it is stronger than it appears on the surface. The Galactic Colossus costs 27,500 mass. Again, that's compared to the Monkey Lords in 19,000, just for a reference point. Moving on to the Yathatha. You'll notice that Yathatha actually has more range than the GC has. It does not have Omni, however. And they both have the same walking speed of 2.5, which actually the Monkey Lord shares as well, if I'm not completely mistaken. Let me find my number here. Yes, 2.5. Now, different things about the Athatha. The Athatha is a little bit cheaper than the GC. It costs 25,000 mass. And it has less health. It only has 67,000 health. On its weapons, it has a variety of weapons. You've got the main beam generator. Um, this shoots once every five seconds in a very large blast. It has four area of effect. See, there it is right there. It has a charge before it fires. And it does 8,000 damage on contact. It does 1,600 DPS. Then you have the Gatling Plasma Cannon, which is the continually firing one here. That one does 1,800 damage per second. And then there is the Heavy Cannon. This one does 1,200 damage per impact on a 6 area of effect radius. It only fires... You know what? I think I have that backwards. 3.33 seconds. That is the gun that I'm talking about. This one right here. That is the, It has 6 area of effect and it's weaker at 363 damage per second. My bad, people. Um, 1,200 damage on impact. This is the heavy cannon that I was talking about before. The experimental phase on beam generator that does 8,000 damage on impact. That is it. And that is actually the easiest projectile to dodge. Above all else, if you're engaging a chicken you want to dodge this slow moving little uh, ball of light here because that is what wrecks your world now you'll notice if you total it up the athatha actually does a really high dps um we've got 400 2000 and 30 basically 3900 dps which is about double the galactic colossus but you balance that out with the lower health the one other thing that the Yathatha has is a very strange death weapon. Um, when a Yathatha dies, it releases an unidentified energy being right there, which damages everything indiscriminately, whether friend or foe. The amount of damage varies, the range varies, and what it targets varies. But it is an incredibly devastating effect if you can kamikaze the unit into a base or a group of units or whatever else. 
Um, if there is a single target, it will actually strike that single target repeatedly. Uh, it will not land every hit on the target, but it will do a significant amount of damage, and it just kind of floats around in a circle doing random stuff. So the Athatha, once you start going on the downhill side of the health, you definitely want to run in as close as you possibly can before you die. The Athatha is not something that you stand away with and just fight till you die. You need to run in. Um, there's a lot of people that try to stand back with the Athatha and just let it die, and that is a mistake on two fronts because number one, if it dies in your units, it will do damage to your own units, and that's a waste of potential because you're paying for the damage potential of the lightning blast, not just the DPS of your unit. And then mistake number two is you're not applying the DPS to the other person. So it you've got to rush in. You have to rush in. That is the only way to use the Athatha properly. All right, that wraps up Seraphim, and I think that is all of the direct fire for these guys. Now we're going to move on to air units. Um, I need to spawn a czar, which I will do in just a minute. Let me talk about pronunciation for a minute. The Yathatha, I hear some people say it Yathatha, I hear some say it Yathatha or Yathatha or a, a multitude of different ways to say it. Most people just call it a chicken. If you ever hear people referring to a chicken, that's what this is. And I really do not know and do not care how the thing is pronounced. And then the other unit is the Czar or Caesar. I always, I used to always call it Caesar, but uh, people were frustrated with me for that for reasons I will never figure out. And so I do not call it that anymore. Um, there we go. Now I just have confused pronunciation. So the reason I called it a Caesar forever was because if you look in most places it was referred to as I, I think there was actually a dash in it at one point but I always pictured it as carrier czar because it's an aircraft carrier so I always said C czar I mean it's obviously uh, not a direct word because it's all caps but that is beside the point let's not uh, spend too much time on that pronounce it however you want Caesar czar Yathatha, 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 whatever. Um, point is, we need to talk about the damage. The Caesar costs 45,000 mass, making it, actually it's right in the middle, it is the second most expensive. Um, it has 58,000 health, which doesn't sound like a lot, but the thing vets incredibly quickly on anything tiny. Its main weapon is a very large, very strong beam, um, does 3,300 damage per second. Weird numbers on these DPSs. You can see right there. And it's on a 4 damage radius. So basically you just want to rake this across whatever enemies you have. There is something odd about the firing mechanism though because if you specifically target certain um, certain units it will turn on the gun, turn off the gun, move to the next unit, and it kind of does a funny firing cycle, and it wastes a lot of DPS. What you want to do is you want to get it close to enemies, and then you just want to move it around, generally hovering over the area that has the unit in it. The four area of effect will save you. You'll consistently hit the same target, and the beam stays on when it's raking over enemies. So basically, you just drag it over everything and kill everything that you possibly can, and this, the Caesar will vet very quickly, and have a tremendous amount of health, a good amount of regen, and one other thing that this is good at, besides the 3,000 damage per second ground weapon and the fast vetting, is its anti-air. This is actually a decent uh, anti-air platform, and a lot of people underestimate it. It has four 230 damage per second projectile launchers for anti-air, and those are the guided... Um, the guided shells that pop out of all four corners of the czar and then they fire towards one target. So those will do basically a thousand damage per hit and um, they fire once every 1.3 seconds. So a fairly good uh, fire rate on those. Those will quickly knock out single air targets. And then the other thing it has 
as two flak launchers, each one doing 960 damage per second. So a combined near 2k air damage in the flak. Now the one thing about the flak is it is only on the sides. And yes, the Caesar does have a front, back, and sides. And you can see which side is the front by moving, I thought, but apparently not. That is the flat cannon right there. Um, when those are facing units, they will fire and they do a thousand blanket damage to the group of units that it is firing at. There we go. It's finally settled. You can see how it turns. This is the front, this is the back, and these are the sides. It just has a very slow turn speed. Let's put one farther out. There we go. It is actually nosing into it now. So it's got one flat cannon on each side, which can only fire to the sides. It's not a rotational weapon. So that is something to keep in mind. If you stack a couple of uh, Caesars on top of each other and then lead an air fight into it, the flat can be very, very devastating. The one other weapon that this unit has is a depth charge. Yes, the Caesar actually has torpedoes. Who would have thought it? Um, they are very wimpy, though. They only do 38 damage apiece, and there are two of them. So, you know, that totals out 276 DPS on the torpedo launcher. So that is the carrier's are, and because it is a carrier, it does build air units. It has to be stationary to do so. We can move it right here, stop it, and build a strap bomber in 46 seconds. It's gonna sit right there producing, and then it can unload. Uh, the other thing about this carrier is that you can actually load air units into it. I know it holds over 100, but I'm not sure of the actual capacity, and it will repair and refuel units that are held inside the carrier. So that can be very handy in the late game when you have large swarms of ASF or strap bombers or whatever else. You're going to load them all up, repair and refuel them all at the same time, and then unload them again. And it goes very quickly, much easier than using refueling stations. All right, moving on from the Caesar. The Soul Ripper, this is the Cybran Air T4. It is the cheapest at 3,400 mass. And it is also a unit that has insane veterancy. Its main weapon is a pair of rocket packs, or I'm sorry, bolters, that do 1,000 damage apiece for a total of 2,000 damage. You can see it actually does land. This is technically a gunship, but it cannot fire on other gunships. So that spray right there, that is the bolter. Um, it does have area of effect. It is a three radius area of effect, and that makes it exceptionally good at knocking out swarms of Tech 1 engineers for taking out bases and all that kind of thing, which is what allows it to vet so quickly and rack up absolutely ludicrous um, health numbers. The disadvantage to this is because of the terrible accuracy, it can never land 100% of its damage on a single target, such as an ACU or a small unit. And so sometimes it's not the most efficient thing at taking out single targets, whereas a Caesar can bring its entire 3,000 damage per second to bear on one unit 100% of the time. Um, it has two other weapon systems. One is a direct fire weapon that also fires at the ground. You can see the pair of rockets that fires every once in a while. Um, those do 285 DPS times two and just add a little damage on a sporadic interval. And then the last thing is the Nanite anti-air system, which does a combined 240 damage per second. Basically, it can defend itself from interceptors and not a whole lot else and is not terribly effective at defending itself from interceptors. So it is not totally helpless, but close to it. Um, it cannot fire on other gunships. So you can actually use a swarm of broadswords or whalers or restorers and you can use a group of those to take out one of these soul rippers and it's actually a really effective weapon because they have a boatload of dps so that is the soul ripper and last we have the awasa which is a strange unit i'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about this one after i read you the statistics just so that you have a little bit better idea of how to use this unit because it is it, it is a doozy 
Um, statistics are as follows: forty-eight hundred mass or forty-eight thousand mass. My bad. Making it the most expensive air experimental. It has fifty-two thousand health, which is quite respectable, and does vet quickly as do the other air units. Mostly because. When I say that quickly, it's because it doesn't really have to chase down its units like the land experimentals do. You can pick a blob of small units and kill them all in one firing cycle and bam, instant veterancy, which is basically the only thing that keeps the air experimentals alive because by the time they're on the field, ASF are also on the field, which demolishes air T4. Uh, it has one main gun, which is a tactical bomb doing 1100 DPS. And then it has four anti-air cannons doing 450 damage per second a piece, totaling out to 1,800 air damage. Now, a lot of people severely underestimate the amount of damage that the Owasa can actually do with its anti-air cannons. You cannot send only 10 ASF after a Owasa and expect them to survive because it will kill all of them and get a veterancy in the process. Um, you do need to sw send swarms, uh, I would say probably 30 to 40 ASF will easily take out Nawasa without having heavy losses. It is not like the Soul Ripper where you can effectively attack with 3 ASF and do a significant amount of damage. It's just not going to happen. So that is the Owasa in a nutshell. Now... I need to talk a little bit about this unit because the Owasa is highly misunderstood and all it wants is your love because it is actually a brilliant unit. Sometimes it is referred to as the T4 Mercy and I will show you why in just a second, but we're going to talk about movement patterns first. The Owasa absolutely sucks at targeting units. You do not ever want to target a unit and let your Owasa fly around. You always want to manually target it and move around with it. So basically you just want to keep your move orders far away from the plane and guide it around as you wish. You want to put it on ground fire which you can e either do by clicking this little icon here and doing that or you can use the right left bracket key, my bad, to cycle through them right there. So that is ground fire. Once you place it on ground fire, you can either press the A button to get an attack ring or you can press this icon and you're just going to place an attack move on the ground. And when you place an attack move on the ground, you have a 99.999% chance that the Owasa will actually drop a bomb. This is how you solve the my Owasa will not drop bombs problem. And then as you're winging it around, you can see the recharge time right there. We have a bomb lined up straight. And I missed it because I placed the order too close to the Owasa. You can see even I get bad at this sometimes. So just need just enough space for it to line up straight and boom, there we have a bomb drop. And you can actually watch when it drops and just make sure when the yellow dot appears under it, you can actually throw your Owasa into a full stall and prevent it from flying over too much anti-air just like that and if you get really fancy you can actually hover bomb with it which i am incredibly bad at but you can do it nope that was not it but there you have it that is basic micro for the awasa which you definitely need to practice with now the reason that they call it a t4 mercy is because you can target and control K and do a significant amount of damage. The Awasa has 10,000 crash and an 11,000 bomb, totaling 21, which is more health than any single ACU has at T3 unless it's got other combat upgrades. So basically, you can place an attack. You can see uh, 11,000 will not kill this Scathus. And then as soon as the bomb drops, you control K your Awasa, and both will hit KOing the target. And you lose your Awasa that way, but that allows you to do far more damage, and you can also control K this son of a gun on top of a Paragon or a Novax or anything else that you want to kill that is under shields. As long as it has 10k health or less, you can kill it. That goes for nuke defense as well. So that is something to remember. And for those of you who do not know, the key command for that you have two control k commands you have a uh, control k 
which gives you the 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 countdown timer, which is a pain in the butt when you're trying to do something like this. Or you can press F1 and scroll down through the list. I do not remember exactly where it is, but there is a command for instant control K without a countdown. And you want to set that for two keys that are very far apart so that you do not accidentally hit it because you do not get second chances with this order. There's your control K, four, three. You can press control K again and save your unit. I have mine set to shift control K on my secondary gaming pad, which is actually four keys apart and impossible to hit unless I want to. And when you press those three keys together, bam, there are no second thoughts. Your unit is gone in about half a second. Alrighty guys, that wraps up the T3 or T4 units for all four factions. Again, outside of Game Enders and Navy. I will do the Naval T4s with the Naval units when I do that in, actually I'm planning to do that this week um, to get my other tutorial out just so I can have all of the units covered. And then the Game Enders will be covered sometime well down the road. Alrighty guys, I hope that everybody learned something from this, and of course if I missed anything, as always, add it in the comments, and I will put annotations into the video with any features that I missed, and hopefully this will help someone be able to win a game that they otherwise couldn't have won if they did not know all of the little ins and outs of their units. Alright, that's going to wrap it up for me. I will catch you guys in the next video. Thanks.